All right, Jason Blood Church coming to you tonight. God bless each and every one of you. We have a special live stream tonight. I hope you guys will find it to be an absolute blessing. We uh, have two special guests, Robert Breaker and Brandon Peterson. And um, we are going to just praise the Lord tonight, all power and glory to him. And and hopefully and, uh, we can uh, give you some blessings and some great teachings here tonight and answer some of your questions. But I'm going to turn it over to Robert Breaker to start us off with a word of prayer. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Can you all hear me okay? Gotcha. Okay. Lord, we just come to your prayer tonight. We just, Lord, we come to you, uh, thankfully, through the blood and knowing that we're on our way to heaven. We thank you, Lord, for the gospel. But Lord, we come to you today through the, the book, Lord. We thank you for this perfect book that you've given us. And thank you, Lord, that we can fellowship and know that you are God that's given us just a miracle, Lord. And I can't wait to talk about it today. And uh, we just thank you, Lord, for those that have come. And we just pray, Lord, now that you'd uh, let us be edifying to the hearers. And may they learn. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, amen. Amen to that. So, so Brandon, um, you know, we brought you on because we wanted you to tell your story. Uh, we wanted to hear your testimony, how, you, how, how God moved you to write the book that you wrote, and to show the power of the KJV Bible in numbers. And so I'm going to let you, let you take over and sort of tell your story. And we'll, we'll jump in with, we have some questions, Robert. He, um, you can jump in as well if you do have some questions for him. Okay. Yeah, anytime. Just interrupt anytime. Um, <clears throat> any questions, just let me know. Um, yeah. So basically, I don't, I've never really put out my testimony before on YouTube, which I should. Um, <clears throat> but uh, it's funny because a lot of people started requesting it this past week. Um, and, uh, even well, there's YouTube comments, somebody was emailing me, asking me about it, asking me to make a video about it and stuff. So it's nice to be able to, to share it here. Um, so yeah, I got saved in 2014. Well, let me back up before there. So grew up going to church every Sunday and, uh, heard wasn't, it wasn't a King James church. It was just, a wasn't like a non-denominational, non-denominational church, but it was a, uh, very small denomination. It was kind of similar to Baptists. Um, but uh, anyways, I went to church every single Sunday and I knew about God. I knew uh, like basic Bible stories and everything, uh, but I had no desire to read the Bible. I had, uh, it was just you know pretty much a religion, just going to church every week. And um, even went to a private school, like a Christian private school um, from kindergarten to eighth grade. And then in high school, uh, I went to a public school, and that was a bit of a shock to me because now we have everybody like you know talking about all the worldly things you could talk about. Uh, where in private school it was a lot more limited. Um, so in public school, it was um, yeah, I was exposed to the world, I guess you could say, and that's where I pretty much fell into the world. And um, I don't think I was really saved before that, but just kind of my moral standard that I learned from church just kind of, you know, fell away. Um, so anyways, I, uh, yeah, was a sinner like everybody else um, and righteous in my own eyes, I guess you could say. I was greedy. Uh, well, I mean, perversion in my mind, like, you know, just anyways. So 2014 comes along. Um, and a video so okay so my wife laura and i we met in march of 2014 and we got married in june so we got married really fast um and we got so we got yeah we met in march got engaged in may and we got married in june and i got saved in between that time where we were engaged in may and then uh married in june june 6th so I don't know the exact day I got saved, but I know the, I'll, I'll never forget the, the day itself. Basically a video kind of popped up to, it popped up in my head from, from high school because in high school I went to this uh, like fellowship of Christian students uh, type of club meeting thing every now and then in the morning. And one day they played this video, um, this like little five minute sermon thing. And for some reason or another, that thing stuck with me. And uh, I didn't really think of it much after, but then all of a sudden, 
this thing just popped up in my head and it's like, I needed to watch this. Um, so I'm with my wife, Laura, we were um, in a room, rips out our bedroom. It's like an office kind of room. And I say, let me look up something on YouTube real quick and try to find it. And I found it really fast somehow. I don't, I'm not even sure how, I didn't even know the name of the video or anything. Um, but anyway, so I watched that video. It was uh, basically, you know, saying like, the God of love is not, you know, the God that's preached by America is not the God of the Bible. God is holy. And, you know, you're, you know, going to pay for your sins. Um, so anyways, I uh, was very convicted by the Holy Spirit, by the Holy Ghost. And um, I knew I was going to hell for my sins. So I immediately went to the other room and I just fell to my knees before the Lord and I cried out to him. I think it was, I'm not sure if I said anything out loud, I might've, but it was definitely from my heart. And um, I was, please save me. Like, I, I can't save myself, like, please save me. And immediately it was a rushing of like, it felt like literally like chains were being ripped off of my chest, like physically, it literally felt like that. It felt like, uh there was a flood of peace and joy just filled me i started crying just like from uh just joy and not really sure just feeling like free and um yeah i know that experience doesn't happen for everybody but for me it was a very i guess you could say powerful like conversion when i believed on him and i really like like i i didn't see him there but i could like see him there in like my mind like just light like he was there like i was I, I don't know how to explain that but um so anyways yeah it was it was a uh it was a good like very powerful uh, conversion when it comes to sanctification that was a different story um so i was reading from uh, modern versions for about five years um so from 2014 to about 2019, um, I never even thought about the King James Bible. It never caught, never came to my brain. It never crossed my mind. I didn't, I mean, every Bible to me was the Bible. I didn't know whether there was differences or anything like that. Uh, but it was definitely a chore to me to read the Bible. Like I knew I had to, I knew I was supposed to, but I never felt like a desire to. And I knew that was wrong. And I didn't understand that. And um, yeah, it was just during those years, it was very kind of silent, like didn't really hear God speaking. And um, I would ask God over and over again, what do you want me to do? What do you want from me? And I just kept asking that over and over again. And it was just silent. And um, I was reading the NIV, the ESV, and a little bit of the NASB. And it just felt like a textbook, like that you would read at school, like very dry. And there's just no desire to read it. Like once and every once every now and then, it would be like, oh, that's a there's a cool truth. But it wasn't like anything like what the King James Bible would be when I first read that. Um, so once I started noticing that there were differences, the first thing I kind of noticed and picked up on was that fasting was removed uh, in Matthew, and I picked up on that. And that got my attention a lot because why would fasting be gone from the Bible? Like, why is it here in this version, but not in that one? Um, I don't even remember how I came across that. But uh, one day I was on YouTube and my wife picked out a sermon for us to watch. And it was a Charles Lawson sermon. He was talking about how in the NIV, they had changed Lucifer's name to the morning star, which is Jesus' name. I was like, whoa. So... At that point, we had listened to Charles Lawson for a good amount of time, but we didn't even know he was King James only. I had no idea what King James only was. I didn't know what that term was. I didn't even know there was such a thing. Um, I didn't know there was people who believed the King James Bible was perfect. That's how, you know, limited my world was. Um, anyways, after that sermon, I asked my wife, Laura, to order me a King James Bible on Amazon. She did. So just a normal, like, 15 or $20 KGV came in the mail. So I started reading from that, and that's where God started speaking to me. And I started feeling like this is, like, the more you read this, like, 
back in my five years, I was like very like kind of like halfway in God, halfway in the world. It that completely changed. I lost all desire for the things of this world. Everything became about Christ and about His Word, and it's like it's a whole different thing when you hear God speaking to you, and you ask Him questions, and He answers you in this book. And that was happening to me. I would ask Him questions in prayer, and then I would open the Bible, and there was the answer. And this would happen over and over and over again. And this is way before anything numbers related. I started to believe this is, you know, God's word. Uh, this is this is different. This is like living water. This isn't like those dry textbooks I was reading. Mm-hmm. So yeah. I pretty much became King James only without knowing who any of the major teachers are in King James only. Uh, so I, like uh, Gail Ripplinger, Peter Ruckman, Robert Breaker. I didn't know who these people were. And I just started believing this is the Bible um, just from reading it. And my walk with Christ did a complete change. And my wife just looked at me one day. It was like, what happened to you? Like, this is this was not you before, like in a good way. Uh, and I was like, I don't even know. Like, every, like, I just love the Bible. Like, and then we went back on my Facebook timeline. I was like, hey, this is like that kind of the time where everything started changing. That's when I got the King James Bible. I was like, yeah. I started, uh, you know, this book is actually speaking to me. And then I kind of made the connections like those other Bibles were not at all bringing me back to them. Uh, it felt like a chore to read them. Whereas this, I want to continue reading it. It's like hard to put it down. Um, or you'll get hung on like one verse and it's like it's like burning into your soul. Um, so anyways, that's my uh, basically my testimony from salvation to uh getting into the King James. Um, As far as the numbers go, because where do the numbers come from? The uh, Chuck Missler is a popular teacher on YouTube. And I guess before he was alive uh, and I watched some stuff from him about like Hebrew and Greek stuff. And there's some interesting things in there with the Hebrew and Greek, like patterns and numerics. Uh, And I started looking into that and I was trying to verify. I remember I was at the hospital for my son. He had like the flu or something like that. Um, um, And I was trying to verify something that Chuck Missler said about like Genesis 1-1 and John 1-1 being like connected with like pi and the letter E, um, whatever that constant is called. And I was trying to verify that, but I couldn't figure out what he was talking about. And I ended up landing on somebody else's website with Hebrew and Greek. So anyways, like long story short, uh, this person's website who I landed on, not King James only or anything, it was just looking at Hebrew and Greek, and I was like, wow, this is pretty amazing uh, that all this stuff exists and kind of like proving this is God's word. So anyways, that's where I kind of started like wondering about, yeah, maybe like three or four months after that, I started wondering about the King James Bible. I'm like... If all these amazing things exist in the Hebrew and Greek, what about this book that's speaking to me? So that's when I kind of started looking into the King James Bible. Now, at first, um, I was kind of like, you know, I knew all the things I knew about from the Hebrew and Greek pattern. So I was looking for Hebrew and Greek, kind of like the same kind of numbers in, in this one, which they are there. And I have like a video, like an old video about that. But once I started just kind of simplifying things and just kind of asking God and seeking him, you know, ask, seek, knock, Matthew 7, 7. Um, Once you just kind of put the pieces together, like God's perfect number is seven. And once I started looking into the number seven, that's when everything just started pop, like exploding. Like this Bible is like, that's his number. And once you see that revealed in, in, from the, his, you know, how many times Jesus has mentioned, uh, to the Father and Son and God and all these, you know, amazing like macro patterns. Like they're they're just the perfect number of mentions and the perfect placements. It's like this is like laser surgery. Like this is like perfect uh, for one thing after the next, and not just like small things. Like these are big things. Like these are like how, you couldn't imagine this. And once I just got a hold of the number seven, once God revealed that to me, I don't take credit for any of this. Um, I am. I am less than the least. Like I, I. This is all God's like work. I give all glory to Him. But as uh, as, as when I started 
when he started showing me the sevens, it was just everything like, yeah. So as far as the book goes, um, I actually didn't, I thought about writing before, but I never really um, put it into action. It was actually a, a pastor from California who called me and kind of prompted me to ask me to, if I was going to write a book. And a lot of people started asking me and I started praying to God about it because I have I had these videos on my YouTube channel. And um, uh, they just started asking me to write a book. And I was like, okay, I'll write like a little, maybe a little tiny like handbook of notes and I turn it into this giant thing. Um, so, yeah, I mean, and this is just this, literally like this just scratching the surface. Like I cannot imagine the things that are in the Bible that I have not seen. It's like, even wow. in the videos that I've shown, I'm, I've only like got out like maybe 2% of the things that I've found. And I, I, I kind of just, <laughs> I pray to God before each video that I make. I don't randomly just start putting the other videos. I have I kind of like a list of ideas and I just put it before the Lord and I let him kind of confirm and direct and uh, just wait for him to answer and lead. But um, my testimony is God is not silent at all when you're in his word and you're actually seeking him with your heart. He will speak to you. He will, whatever your calling is, if you don't know what it is yet, he will show it to you over time. Just keep asking and seeking and knocking and he will. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's that's pretty much from now to, from then to now. I'm not sure if uh, I missed anything, but that's the brief summary. Amen. Amen. If I could Amen. interject real quick, um, yeah, I go tried ahead. to put into the chat the video that we're talking about, and I put in the wrong video, so I finally figured that out. But uh, let me put it in real quick again. And what Brandon has done here is he's put together a video that proves that the King James Bible is mathematically perfect. I mean, can you say it any other way than that? And uh, math proves that the King James Bible is God's word. No other version does like that. And I brought some more material, too. And it's like you said, it's just the tip of the iceberg, what you've presented so far. There is so much more. And I'm excited to present a little bit more to get you maybe stimulated to make more videos like that. <laughs> and then, um, you can't argue with math. And uh, there was a man, a famous man that the world claims was very intelligent. What was his name? Uh, Einstein. Einstein. Yeah. And Einstein said, I won't believe in a God that you can't prove mathematically. Boy, if Einstein was alive today, your video might lead him to the Lord. I mean, it's just incredible how the math works. But um, I've got some stuff here to present. Jason, do you want to say something first or can I go ahead? Uh, yeah, well, I mean, so what's funny is you both are you both are going to be the math wizards and I'm just going to be sort of the director. You know what I mean? Like this and, and amen, because you guys are a blessing. And, you know, I Brandon, that was awesome. But, you know, testimony was awesome. How you came to the Lord is awesome. Everyone has a great story, how they came to the Lord. And God moved. And the way God moves, right, is it, it's all glory to him. And it's just amazing to hear, your, you know, that you're saved. And, again, if if nobody, if nobody, someone's not saved here today, you know, it, today is the day to do it. That we don't know how much time we have left in this church age for the rapture. And it's by the blood of Jesus Christ. He paid the price 2,000 years ago when he got on that cross. Amen. on his own right he he wasn't forced he did it himself because he loves you enough to die for you first corinthians 15 1 through 4 it's your gospel he died buried and rose from the dead believe with that with your heart call out to the lord and be saved and there's nothing else added ephesians 2 8 9 not by works or any man can boast and uh so i don't care who kicks it off first robert you want to go first and then we'll let brandon what? do his presentation sure, sure. are you going to show are you going to share your screen or what i need to do so you right. can but just make me bigger so they can see it, I guess. Let me see if um, I can make us all bigger. Hold on a second. Okay. So I've got two books here that I've gotten over the years. And uh, one of them is by a guy from the Philippines named Perry, Periander Esplana. And Periander Esplana mm -hmm. wrote this book, The Mathematical Perfection of the King James Bible. And math is over my head in a lot of ways. So I'm not, I'm not the biggest math fan. I'm not that great at math, but he has charts. He has so many things in here and he just proves how it must be that God did this. I, I thought this was interesting on page four. Let's see. No, not page four. Well, I mean, I'll just throw it up there. People can, can, uh, can do a pause later, but, uh, this page, if you take, uh, this verse of the Bible, let's see, am I showing the right direction? Oh, there we go. 
and you take the verses, and for some reason, if you split them in two, and you count the number of consonants and the number of, of vowels, it comes out to 1611. I mean, that's just coincidence, right? Hmm. There's just, there's too many coincidences. God's pointing to the number seven, and he's pointing to 1611. And um, I don't have time to get into this book. I don't I don't even know where to get this book. Please don't email me and ask me for it. Try to find this brother. Brother, maybe you can find him. We can have him on. He can tell people how to get that book. Was that the but, first and the last verses? Um, <clears throat> oh, yeah. That, 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 yeah, something about the first and last verses in the Bible. Cut in half. But also he talks about 1 John 5, 7. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. In the beginning. Okay, yeah. The, the first verse and the last verse. And you count the mm-hmm. numbers of consonants and, and, and vowels if you divide the verses in half. And it's 1611, 1611. Just coincidence right but there was another thing in here too that he he put first john 5 7 and uh, many of your so-called uh, new versions i can't even call them versions I, I call them perversions they take out first john 5 7 but he goes through and he does math in first john 5 7 and proves that it only works mathematically with first john 5 7 in both greek and english and i don't i don't have time to get into that but this is what i wanted to get to this is amazing so I had a guy about four or five years ago call me on the phone and he'd call me every couple of months with more information. And he was a, a guy that was in the Navy and in the Navy, he was a code breaker. So he'd run, sit around all day and look at puzzles and break codes. And he got saved and he began to go through the King James Bible and he just found just thing after thing after thing after thing. And he would send it to me. I'd go to the mailbox and there's a card or a letter from him. Hey, by the way, Brother Breaker, here's some more. Just some of the stuff he sent. Everything's divisible by seven in the King James Bible. In Christ shows up 77 times in 77 Mm -hmm. verses. All the forms of baptize in the Bible, 77 times shows up. Only in the King James. Um, Amen, with a capital A, shows up seven times, or 77 times in the Mm -hmm. King James Mm -hmm. Bible. It actually shows up 78, but that one's not a capital. One's well, not capital, yep. Right. Um, <clears throat> mm-hmm. The word rock with a capital R in the King James Bible, seven times. And just, uh, he sent me his notes, and I've got all these notes, and it's just amazing. Um, Thus saith the Lord. That shows up 49 times in the King James Bible, which is what? Seven times. Uh, is it seven? Yeah. Word of God shows up exactly 49 times, seven times seven. And I mean, it's just amazing. Lord God shows up 14 times, seven times two. Um, you've probably seen a lot of these, but they just Jehovah. We have the word Jehovah in our King James Bible seven times. Mm-hmm. Hand husbandmen, husbandmen found seven times in the mm-hmm. King James Bible. Mm-hmm. The word, capital W, the word, Jesus, the capital W, yep. seven times in the King mm-hmm. James Bible. Now, either this was these really smart men that translated the King James Bible. And they did this, or the Lord did this through them, and they didn't know what they were doing. I tend to lead that way because what does Psalms 12, 6, and 7 say? That the word of the Lord is pure, purified seven times. So God was right there doing all this. Uh, The words gospel of God shows up seven times. Message seven times. Thunder seven times. My beloved son shows up exactly seven times in the King James Bible. Uh, Spirit of God, okay? Spirit of God shows up, guess how many times? 28 times. But two of those times, it's lowercase s, and the rest is uppercase. Or it's a one, or, oh, no, um, 22 times, it's, uh, uh, I think, lowercase, and then four times is uppercase. That makes 26. But then you add Spirit of Christ, that shows up two times. That makes 28, makes seven. <laughs> I mean, it's all right there. I'm I'm not going to go through the whole book, but just some of these were just a blessing to me. And I don't know if he'd want me to give his name. So I'll just give you his initials, um, old TC. This was amazing. This just, man, gives you goosebumps. Forgive shows up 56 times in the King James Bible, seven times eight. Forgiven, right? Past participle, I think that's called, 42 times. Forgiveness, seven times. (laughs) reconciled seven times confessed 28 times confessed seven times favor you know find favor with the lord favor 70 times consecrate 14 times consecrated 14 times all these are divisible by seven sanctify seven times 
Now, this one I found many, many years ago, and I told Gail Ripplinger about, Ripplinger about it. And she was like, wow, the word blood shows up in the King James Bible 447 times. Actually, 448. Excuse me. I think I said that right. Uh, it's I think it's 448 times. The word sin shows up 447 <clears throat> times. The other way around. Yeah, blood is 447. Yeah. I and got then that sin right. is 448, yeah. <clears throat> the wilderness of sin with a capital S. So if you figure in that capital S, it's the mm -hmm. same number for sin as it is for blood. Oh, wow. So I didn't know every that. sin in the King James Bible, there's enough blood to cover it. You know what new versions do? They take out the blood, and there's more sin in the new versions than there is the blood of Jesus. Woo, it gives you goosebumps when you learn all this stuff. And, Amen. Amen. Uh, uh, finished, the word finished shows up 42 times in the King James Bible. Rested shows up 21 times. I'm not trying to steal your thunder. I just, I, I'm excited. Oh, no, this is all good. Yeah. <laughs> ceased, like cease and cease and desist, like stop. Ceased 70 times. Finished 42 times. All these are divisible by seven. Perfectly shows up seven times in the King mm -hmm. James Bible. The words, the end of the world. Guess how many times shows up in the King James Bible? Seven. Ends of the earth, 28 times. Uh, peculiar, seven times. Workmanship, seven times. Tabernacle of the congregation shows up 21 times just in the book of Exodus. And I mean, wow, the 77th time that the word church shows up in the Bible just happens to be the last church, Laodicea. Coincidence? No. Now, what are we as Christians? We're supposed to be witnesses. That shows up 49 times in, in our Bible. We're an assembly. That shows up 49 times in our Bible. We're the bride. That shows up 14 times. All these divisible by seven. First fruits shows up seven times. Fishers. Oh, actually, first fruits is seven times in the New Testament. Uh, fishers, seven times in the Bible. Kinsmen, seven times in the Bible. And on and on and on. I thought this was interesting. Daughter of Zion. Z-I-O-N, 26 times. Okay, that's not divisible by seven. Well, there's twice for some reason the King James Bible spells it Zion. Instead of Z-I-O-N, it's S-I-O-N. That makes it 28, seven times four. Daughter of Jerusalem, seven times. I mean, it's just, wow. And I don't want to go through his whole thing, but I, he gave me his notes and just how he... Didn't even have a computer. He was literally going through by hand, counting oh, wow. stuff, no and way. finding his stuff back <laughs> in the 60s and the 70s. Oh, wow. And uh, it was just incredible. I think there was one more here that was really good. So I just, you, you're on to something is what I'm saying here. But you just touched the, the, the tip of the iceberg. There's so many more. And how anyone could not believe that the King James Bible is God's perfect preserved word, I don't, I don't understand. I guess that was all. I think, okay, that's all in his book. I, I found one while I was sitting here before we started. I just thought to myself, you know, God is so wonderful. wonder how many times wonderful shows up in the King James Bible. Put it in mm -hmm. 21 times in the King James wow. Bible. That's seven times three. <laughs> the Trinity, three. You know, God is wonderful. So, it, yeah. I mean, what do you do with that? Throw any other version in the trash and keep the King James is what I say. Mm -hmm. Clearly, God is telling us that's his word. So, amen. Amen, brother. So, Brandon, um, we can let you can go ahead and do your presentation. I don't know if I can get the screen big enough um, for you. Well, I mean, I don't have anything. I do have one thing kind of prepared, but just in general, I guess. Let me just go off a couple of things that Robert just said because he said some pretty cool things. Um, and let me share my screen. see if I can do this. <clears throat> so the program that I have found to be superior by any other Bible program times 100 is this one right here. It's called King James Pure Bible Search. And King James Pure Bible Search is, is awesome because of how exact it is. Um, so for example, in other softwares like Blue Letter Bible, if you type in Peter, for example, it's going to give you uh, all the results for Peter, but it's also going to throw in some uh, results for Peter's, like with an apostrophe S. And once you start actually digging into the word and looking into this stuff, there is no question at all that God has purposely left words singular, and then there's words that are 
possessive. Um, and there's patterns that will go through, you know, run through both of those lines of words. Uh, but it was interesting. One of the things I found a couple, maybe like two weeks ago, um, Robert mentioned that blood is mentioned 447 times. So if you see up here in the top left, I can kind of filter out the um, um, basically the Old Testament, New Testament. I can just you know look at what how many words are in like Genesis, for example, or the Gospels or whatever. But I thought this was really cool. I found this like a week or two ago. Uh, so blood is mentioned 447 times in the Bible. Uh, if you just look in the um, in the New Testament, heaven and earth are mentioned together 447 times. So blood in the entire Bible is mentioned 447 times, and in the New Testament, heaven and earth are, is mentioned 447 times. I thought this was pretty interesting. Wow. Um, another thing that you were talking about was uh, wonderful, which reminded me of Isaiah 9-6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. So Wonderful, like you said, is 21 times. Counselor, I believe is, let me check, it might be like 14 times. Yeah, 14. And then the Mighty God is seven times. So wonderful twenty one counselor fourteen the mighty God is seven, and then the everlasting Father and the Prince of Peace are both mentioned once, just here in this verse. Um, but yeah, I thought just I was just taking down notes as you were saying those things. That was really interesting about the witnesses being forty nine times. So yeah, so basically, um, I don't have like I don't know how many people on here are familiar with what I've already published. So what I can kind of do is just kind of go over. I guess like the basic stuff, like not like basic, but like the stuff that's like kind of like highest impact, I would say, you know, if I was, if someone were to walk up to me and they didn't believe in the Bible and they were to ask me like, you know, can you prove this? I guess I can kind of show you the things I would probably go after first. Um, and uh, yeah, so this is my book, by the way, and I have in the back, I have indexes. And I have, in the last index, I have them sorted by category, and I have um, something called the first and the last. And obviously, Jesus is Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. And one of the biggest things that I found, one of the biggest, like, I guess you can say, like, macro patterns, like categories of patterns, is finding things in the first and the last. So, um, so like Robert Breaker was saying, in Genesis 1 1, Revelation 22 21, those have the same amount of consonants and vowels. Um, and let's see here. And, and like I said, the last word of the Bible, Amen, capitalized, is mentioned 77 times. So the first word of the Bible, let me go to Genesis 1, is in. And then the last word of the Bible is Amen. And if I just look at Genesis and Revelation, the first and the last books. So as you can see, I just checked off Genesis only and Revelation only. So in and amen together are mentioned 777 times. So those are the first and the last words in the first and the last books of the King James Bible. Um, now in Revelation 22, the last thing that Jesus Christ says, praise God, is surely I come quickly. It's the last thing he says in the Bible. So these two words right here, I come. You look up in Genesis and Revelation, same thing. I come. 777 mentions in both Genesis and Revelation. The words I and come show up 777 times. It's the last thing that he says in the Bible. Um, yeah, so there's a whole bunch of things with the first and the last. Um, even if I, okay, so Genesis 1. In Genesis 1, if you count all the words that God speaks, so for example, and God said, let there be light, and there is light. So one, two, three, four, let there be light. If you just count all the words that God speaks directly in Genesis 1, there are 343 words, and that's seven times seven times seven. And in Matthew 1, in the first book, uh, first chapter of the New Testament, 
uh, God doesn't speak like directly, like it doesn't say like God speaking, but the angel speaks and the angel speaks the word of God. Um, let's see here, wherever it is. Uh, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream saying, so if you count all the words that the angel says, um, it's 49 words, seven times seven. So the first chapter of Genesis, the first chapter of Matthew, you have seven times seven times seven words in Genesis and seven times seven words in Matthew. Um, let's see what else. In Genesis 1, the first and last words of Genesis 1, uh, I actually found this like a week ago. So the first word is in, and then the last word of Genesis 1 is day. Okay? So in and day. Now, if you just look in the whole Bible, those two words. Now, remember, Genesis 1 ends on the sixth day. It doesn't talk about the seventh day yet. So it talks about the first six days of creation. So Genesis 1 has uh, the first and last words, in and day. I'm not sure if anybody can see this because it's really small probably, but the number is uh, 14,406. And when you break that down, that equals 7 times 7 times 7 times 7 times 6. That's how many times the first and last words of Genesis 1 of the six days of creation shows up in the Bible. Um, the seventh word from the beginning and the seventh word from the end. So heaven is the seventh word from the beginning. Jesus is the seventh word from the end of the last verse. Uh, if you look up all the mentions of heaven and Jesus. Now, by the way, I have a um, nice thing about King James Pure Bible Search is that you can kind of save your, your, your searches. So I can pull these up pretty much anytime. So I have here heaven and Jesus. Um, and I can just double click that and it'll load it into my search program. And I have actually these all available on sealedbytheking.com. So all of the notes that are in that book, or most of them at least, you can just easily just double click and verify them yourself. Uh, so seventh word from the beginning of the Bible and seventh word from the end gives you 1,554. And this is excluding Jesus, which is called justice, because that's not talking about Jesus. Uh, it's including uh, the other, uh, so Acts 7.45, we're talking about Joshua. Uh, it's including him, it's inc including the, in Hebrews 4.8 as well. Um, but anyways, in heaven and Jesus, seventh word from the beginning, seventh word from the end, 1,554 mentions. And that is 777 plus 777. So... You're dealing with the first and the last words, the first and the last verses, the first chapters, the the seventh words from the beginning and the, from the end. And I'm, I'm literally forgetting a bunch of them right now, but there's just so many things um, in the New Testament as well. It's just when you look at the first and the last, that's how you can tell. Like, So people try to say, well, you, this, you could find this in Moby Dick if you looked hard enough. If you just searched like a really large volume of text, you could find these patterns. Well, no, you can't because we're looking in the very beginning and the very end. We're looking at precise places that describe the word of God, that describe the Alpha and Omega. Like this is who he said he is. He's in the beginning and the end. And these are creating all these perfect patterns. Um, and that's so. it's a translation, the King James. Uh, Moby Dick wasn't even a translation. So right. it's even more of a miracle, you know? Amen. Exactly. Amen. So um, there's a whole bunch of other things as well. I could probably go over with the first and the last. For example, um, all words starting with the letter A. Let me go back to just Genesis and Revelation only. So only Genesis and only Revelation. All words that start with A is the Alpha and the Omega. Uh, not, not many words start with a Z, but if you look at all words that have a Z inside of it, um, it'll give you a total of 7,777 in Genesis and Revelation. So we have Alpha and Omega. Even if you look in, uh, I believe it's the O is like translate to the O in the English. If you just look at A and O, like words starting with A and words starting with O, uh, I think if you capitalize it, let me check. I think it gives you uh, 777 plus 777 verses. This thing's not listening to me. Um, uh, yeah, there you go. So 1,554 verses start with capital A or capital O, alpha or omega, alpha or omega. That's 
1,554 is 777 times 2. Um, so that's in Genesis and Revelation. So no matter where you look at it, whether it's the A and Z or A and O, like it's, it's perfect. Um, let's see here. In the, just continuing with first and last, in the New Testament only, if you look at Father capitalized. So the first and last books are Matthew and Revelation. If you look at Father capitalized, you get 49 mentions, seven times seven. Um, and I put the asterisks there because that will include fathers with an apostrophe S. So I could just uh, show it like this. So father and fathers. That's what I like about King James Prayer Bible Search. I'm able to easily just separate that where other programs will kind of confound those. Um, anyways, okay. So there's a whole bunch of different things in the first and the last that I would, I would show. Um, the last mention of Jesus Christ. So the last mention of Jesus Christ is just going to give you the total amounts, like the total mentions in general. But I'm going to go through a list of how many times, how many mentions there are when you look at Jesus Christ in the way that he's mentioned. So <clears throat> actually, let me just pull up my, uh, I have my book in digital version for free. I'm just going to pull this up and just show you for, you can look up all these things on your own if you want, but. Let me pull this up and go to last mention of Jesus Christ. So this is the uh, our Lord Jesus Christ. So last uh, verse of the Bible, Revelation 22, 21. So over here we have like the search. And then in the middle we have uh, within. So this is within Genesis Revelation. And then we have the amount of appearances. So let me just skip down to uh, the good part. So Lord, uh, when it's capitalized in Matthew Revelation, 77 mentions. Um, let's see here in revelation only, uh, Jesus is mentioned 14 times, seven plus seven. Jesus Christ is mentioned seven times in revelation only. Um, so that's if you put, you know, both words together. So Jesus and Christ, um, Christ in Matthew and revelation is 28 times. That's what T seven is by the way. Uh, T seven is one plus two plus three plus four plus five plus six plus seven. And that equals 28 or T seven, seven times four. Um, Oh, this is a good one. I forgot to mention this one in the pure Bible search, but God and Jesus, again, looking at just Genesis and Revelation, are, is mentioned 343 times, seven times seven times seven. So <laughs> it's crazy. Like, uh, let's see here, Jesus and David, an entire Bible, seven times seven times seven times six mentions. And that's really interesting, by the way, because if you actually look at the genealogy of Jesus and Luke, Jesus is 42 uh, g generations away from David, so seven times six. And obviously six is the number of man. So here you see Jesus is very much his, uh, his you know, the God man, um, son of David. Uh, Jesus, all mentions of Jesus, when you exclude all the anti-mentions that are not actually talking about him, you get 70 times seven plus 70 times seven, which is a total of 980, but, uh, that's also interesting. I broke that down in my last video where that just breaks down into even an odd books of the New Testament, where there's, if you look at like Matthew, Luke, Acts, First Corinthians, you just skip over, you just go, you know, odd books and even books. Uh, Jesus is the only heavily mentioned word in the Bible where it shows up exactly 70 times, seven times in the odd books and 70 times, seven times in the even books. And that's a huge number because it's dealing with uh, not only Daniel's 70th week, which I want to talk about after I get go through all this, um, but it's also Jesus himself. And, you know, Peter asked them in Matthew 18, 22, uh, as Peter came to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me? And I forgive him till seven times. Jesus saith unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until 70 times seven. So this is an equation that Jesus himself self spoke, and this produces the most amazing patterns in the Bible, things that I haven't uh, gone over yet. Um, but this is one of them, definitely. Like if you just look at even our odd books, and actually I have that over here as well, somewhere. Um, I have Jesus. So in even books in the New Testament, if I just double click that, so 490 times. And as you can see, I just have every other one checked. So Mark, Luke, 
etc. And then also for the odd books. And then 490 mentions. So that's pretty crazy. Um, Lord and Jesus in the last chapter, seven mentions. Lord Jesus, uh, seven times 17, and 17 is the seventh prime number. Um, so if you look up like all mention, all of that phrase, Lord Jesus, our Lord Jesus, 56 times, seven times seven plus seven. Jesus Christ, uh, it'll be well, 28 times seven times, or you could look at it as seven uh, times seven times four, a T seven times seven, abbreviate it. Lord Jesus Christ, 77 plus seven times, so 84 times. If you look at all these separately, our Lord Jesus Christ in the New Testament, you get seven times seven times 52, 52 weeks in a year, a week is seven. Uh, heaven and Jesus, I already talked about that one, and um, uh, for seventh words from the beginning and the ending. Okay, this one's pretty big. All mentions of Jesus and Christ, and that's excluding anti-mentions. Uh, actually, wait, it goes both ways. So whether you exclude it, so this is an interesting thing. So when I say an anti-mention, I mean, for example, the like in Colossians 4.11, where, let me go there real quick. Sorry if I'm going over this super fast. I'm just trying to get to the good stuff. Um, Jesus, which is called Justice. So that's not talking about Jesus Christ. That's call, talking about a guy named Justice, one of Paul's fellow workers. So that's not Jesus. So I found that like there are se several patterns that will um, exclude him. The big patterns will always like exclude the anti mentions, uh, where it's just literally like you need to find the mentions that are only talking about Jesus. Um, and then the uh, some of the more minor patterns, but they're still like pretty significant. Well, you will include those. Um, <clears throat> God kind of set it up so that anybody can <laughs> pretty easily find these things. But anyways, no matter which way you look at it, whether you in include or exclude, the way that it's set up, you'll get 777 plus 777 mentions of Jesus and Christ, which is crazy. Uh, this one, where you're excluding the anti-mentions of Jesus, you include uh, Christians because has the word Christ in it. That's literally talking about Christ. You're in Christ when you're a Christian. Uh, there's a, so there's three anti-mentions of Jesus and there's three mentions of Christian or Christians. So it kind of offsets each other so you can still get the exact same total. Um, so it's just the way that it's set up is just so perfect. Okay, so if you look in the verse text of the Bible, so um, if you exclude like the Psalm headings and the colophones and the, or the, uh, what are they called? Postscripts in the New Testament. If you look at all mentions of Moses, Jesus, and Christ, you get this crazy number, 2,401, I believe it is, which is seven times seven times seven times seven. And that's crazy. That like we, The Old Testament is like summarized as Moses, right? The New Testament is summarized as Jesus. That's John 1, 17. Um, let me just go there real quick. John 1, 17, for the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. So when you look at Moses and Jesus and Christ and all their mentions, you get seven times seven times seven times seven. And this right here is the 777th mention of Moses. Like, there's absolutely no way that a human being did this. <laughs> there's just zero possible way. Um, let me go back to this. And this is all, we're just looking at the last mention of Jesus Christ in Revelation 22, 21. All of this stuff. So all of this is like, I, I call it the seal of God. Like this is all happening, like on the same exact mention of Jesus. All of these things are adding up and landing you right here. The last mention of him in the Bible. Okay. So uh, again, another one in Genesis and Revelation, Lord, all capitals and Jesus will show up 176 times, which is 16 times 11. Um, King and Jesus and Christ in the New Testament shows up 16, 11 times. And what's really interesting about this one is if you just look at Jesus and Christ in the New Testament, uh, and this is looking at singular mentions. So this is uh, not looking at like the possessive ones. Like I was saying earlier, like they ha there's patterns that will, it's like important to be able to, to separate them in, in your search program. But if you just look at Jesus and Christ, it gives you the number 1525. And the King James Bible, as most people, many people have pointed out, is like 70% the Tyndale Bible. Since 1525 is when Tyndale first published his first printed, his very first Bible. So Jesus and Christ together, 1525. And then when you add the word king, it gives you 1611. So I, th I thought that's pretty interesting. Um, 
And Tyndale, by the way, died giving us this, giving us this book. He, without Tyndale, we wouldn't have a King James Bible. Um, so let's see here. Our Lord Jesus Christ. So this is literally what it says in Revelation 22, 21. It says the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. So if you look at the phrase our Lord, case sensitive, Jesus and Christ, you get 1611 mentions. Um, if you look up Father, Son, Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit, when they're all capitalized, and then Jesus Christ, this is the 777th mention, uh, God, Jesus, Holy Spirit, 777 times three. Um, and then this is the big one. Uh, this is every single uppercase name of God in the Bible and every single uppercase name of Jesus and every mention of Jesus. That's amazing. So 7,777 total mentions when you look at every single uppercase singular name of God, Lord, God, Jehovah, I am, Jah, Branch, King, Jesus. Every single mention brings you 7,777. Um, all of that is happening when you read Revelation 22, 21. And I would say 99.99999% of people reading the King James Bible has no idea about that. But that's happening every single time that they read those words. They are all of these mathematical patterns. They're there and they exist in your Bible. And they, it's just, there's absolutely no way. So like I have access to, um, to search for things in modern versions with uh it's a it's a custom build of pure bible search and nobody else has it i'm the only one who has it and i thank god for it um but i'm able to look for things in other bibles and there's zero like there's not even it's not even close like you'll find like maybe an anomaly once every now and then but there's nothing at all like this as you i mean you would expect you wouldn't expect to find all this like perfectly like no matter which way you look at his name and like it's just everything is just so perfect so um there's more things in here that i found since that i haven't even included in here for example um so the where it says our lord jesus christ if you type that in and then if you add uh, let me check all this so i'm gonna select the whole bible I'm not sure if this is in the new testament so our Lord Jesus Christ, um, light, these are the 777 mentions. So our Lord Jesus Christ, light and life, give you 777 mentions. Uh, if you look up Jesus, way, truth, and life, uh, it gives you 777 times three mentions. So just... There's just no way. And this is just this is just Jesus' name. And obviously Jesus' name is the name above all names. But these things don't just exist with Jesus' name. They exist with the Father, and the Son, with God. Like the most important people of the Bible, you might agree, these are not just, you know, random patterns found throughout the book. These aren't not just, you know, you know, any word where you could just, you know, say, these are the author of the this is the author of the book. Like, how can you possibly say all that's random? Um, so, Brandon, how many other versions have you tried this on? Uh, NIV, ESV, NASB, and the New King James. And it doesn't work, does it? Not even close. The New King James, you'll get the closest, but it's maybe like 15. No, I wouldn't even say that much. Maybe like 10% of them will match just because it's, um, because it is a little bit similar. But the, the other ones are, I mean, the NIV is just like, dude, how many times did they add Jesus to the text? Because they have like Jesus mentioned like over a thousand times or a thousand two hundred times or something like that. It's just a crazy amount of times. It's like he's only in the Greek like 975 times. Um, so, I got, yeah, it's there's nothing like even close. And a lot of it in the bottom. Here, let me find an example here. I, I have tables on my book and I actually have at the bottom of some of the tables at least, I'll have um, the results. Probably can't see that. I'll have the results for like the NIV and the NAS. So I'll plug in the same patterns and I'll show that they don't they don't reproduce. Um, and 
yeah so anyways um there's so much uh that you could like i i could literally go for 24 hours straight and there's just too much for me to to get get into and this is just in the name of jesus so if someone were to come to me and say you know can you prove that the bible is perfect i would start off with the first and the last and then i would show them the name of jesus um I'd, there's a lot of things i could show them next uh oh. but <laughs> well, I thought one thing was really cool was the uh, what the sixteen hundred and eleventh mention of Lord and the sixteen hundred and twelfth mention of Lord was in in yeah. Deuteronomy sixteen eleven. That's really cool because that it's talking to the KJV Bible. You're yeah, being exactly. yep. Yeah, I thought that was neat. So let me show you that one real quick. So if I click, this is another cool thing about pure Bible search. Um, if I click this icon right here, it's probably so tiny. I don't know if anybody can see this, but it shows me, if I click on any of these, it shows me what number mention is and what number of verse. Um, and they're different because sometimes, for example, right here, Lord shows up twice in the same verse. So that'll be the, the 13th and 14th mention of Lord, but only the 13th verse. And then over time, that just gets more different. Anyways, if you go to Deuteronomy 1611, let me just scroll down to it. Um, now, this is just based on Isaiah 34, 16, where it says, Seek ye out of the book of the Lord and read. And has like the Lord's name attached to the book. And that's an end time prophecy. So we need to be able to seek out of his book. And here we go. Deuteronomy 16, 11 has the 16, 11th mention of Lord. Also has the 16, 12th mention of Lord, which is interesting because um, most people don't know this, but the 1611 King James Bible was printed for the pulpit. It was huge. Like it was a massive Bible. You wouldn't just lug around. They didn't create or produce print any uh, Bibles in 1611 that were like for the common man. But right, in 1612, right. they started doing that. Right. It was appointed to be read in churches. And usually there was a chain and it was chained to the pulpit. So you could only come in and read it in the church. Yeah, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So in 1612... <clears throat> And actually, it was able to to purchase like a, a leaf from 1611 and 1612, and it's just a huge difference. Like, so in 1612, it was printed for the common man, um, and you have both of those here in Deuteronomy 1611. Um, I can show you a couple other things with 1611, by the way. So, looking at, um, okay, so I'm going to type in the Lord and case sensitive, and I'm also going to type in the Lord with a capital T case sensitive. So it's pretty much the same thing, but this way it picks up the capital and the lowercase the. So I'm going to show you the book of Moses, so the law. So in the law of Moses, you have the Lord showing up 1769 times. So Genesis, Exodus, um, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Watch what happens when I remove Genesis. 1611 times. So... Moses was alive from Exodus to Deuteronomy, but he wasn't alive during the times of Genesis. So God was the one who must have given him the book of Genesis. Obviously, it was probably passed down as well through the generations, but obviously the Holy Spirit was the, the one directing him and giving him each word. So from the time that Moses is alive in these books, in his books, you have 1611 mentions. And when you include Genesis, it's 1769. And obviously, that's the the landmark year of when the King James Bible was would be um, kind of like standardized into its form that we mostly have today. We don't actually use, nobody actually uses a, an exact 1769 because the 1769 itself had errors in it. But in general, it's recognized. It's the landmark year where it was like the, capital, the standardizations are mostly done. Even some of the capitalizations would be fully standardized later on in 1769, I've found. But it's the landmark year. It's um uh man what is it if you go to like book seven verse seven and like word 777 or book seven so judges seven so that'd be book seven chapter seven and then when you look at the 777th word it's the lord and right in the middle of the sword of the lord where is that there we go the sword of the lord so right here the lord the 777th word of the seventh chapter of the seventh book and that's the 1769th uh verse that mentions uh the lord um wow that's that's amazing yeah so I mean, it's just crazy even in the new testament you go to new testament book number seven oops 
Type in New Testament. First Corinthians seven. That's the seventh book, seventh verse. Uh, it mentions God. That is the if you look at God, case sensitive, which capital G, lowercase O, D. This is book seven of the New Testament, chapter seven, verse seven. This is mention number uh, seventy times seven times seven of God. So. I have so many of these examples just show breaking down the verse inspiration. And that was something that Jason was asking me about. I believe it was you uh, just asked me like, can we prove like verse inspiration and placement of like, and yes, we can. Like there's just so many things. Like if you look at all the chapters of the Bible that have 49 verses, the end of exactly 49, which is seven times seven, there's exactly seven of those chapters. Right. And if you count all the words of those seven chapters that have 49 verses, it's divisible by 777. <clears throat> it's just, there's just so many things. I mean, it's just un unbelievable. Like Revelation 22 ends with, uh, has 21 verses, which is seven plus seven plus seven, seven times three. There's 49 chapters that have 21 verses. So it's like, once you start getting into this, there's just no way this is designed by a man. Um, but the biggest pattern that I've ever found and let me just pull it up here and bring it over to the screen. Um, so this is Figma. I actually use it for work because for work, for my occupation, I'm a web designer. I have my own web design agency online. Um, so we do a lot of website stuff. Um, let's see here. I would want to look in, I think it's in this one. Okay, yeah. So this is from my last video, but this is by far the most incredible pattern that I've ever found in the King James Bible. Um, so it's a lot to look at, but if you just look at it kind of individually. So if you look at Father and Son, just together in the King James Bible, capital Father, capital Son, we're not looking at any possessive mentions like fathers or anything like that. We're also excluding all anti-mentions. So for example, you'll find a capital father in Luke 16, I think it's like 24, where it says like Father Abraham, right? So we're excluding that. We're not counting that right here where it says, but Abraham said, son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest good things. This is talking to the rich man in hell. That's not talking about Jesus. So we're not talking, I went through and removed every single anti-mention. It's not including any of them. It's just talking about God the Father and Jesus the Son. <clears throat> and you never would be able to find this otherwise, like you have to literally manually do that work and go through and remove those. Um, so father and son, 490 times in the Bible, or 70 times seven. Father alone, seven times 37 times. <clears throat> 37 is probably the biggest number in Hebrew and Greek numerics, but it's a whole separate thing. Um, so I believe that is 259, 259 mentions which is also equal 777 divided by three. So if you just look at father alone, it's divisible by seven. And if you look at son, seven times 33 mentions. He was obviously 33 years old and died on the cross. So we have father and son, 70 times seven mentions. And then if you look at them individually, it's also divisible by seven. Also, it's only accompanied by threes, which is interesting. Um, but once you start breaking this down by how it's in the Bible, like where it shows up, where the 77 times mentioned shows up. So there's five mentions back here in the Old Testament. Look what happens in the New Testament. Um, which by the way is almost, let me make a quick note on this. So there could be so many places where they could have made father capitalized or son capitalized where they didn't in the Old Testament. Um, for example, like I think it's 2 Samuel 7:14. I will be his father and he should be my son. So those are not capitalized. So um, you don't include them because they're not capitalized. It's like, why are they not capitalized? Like, it... <laughs> One would look at the King James Bible and think, well, this is very inconsistent. But once you actually see the way that it's constructed, the way that it's everything is purposely capitalized or not capitalized. <clears throat> so you get 343 mentions in the Gospels. That's seven times seven times seven. So the Father and the Son showing up exactly seven times seven times seven times in the Gospels. This is actually... Uh, the first thing that I realized about father and son, I had no idea that there were 70 times seven mentions in total. I just saw this at first. <clears throat> and then I realized it was this when I went through and removed them all. And then I realized it was all of this. Uh, 
So in Revelation, there's seven mentions of father and son. In the first seven epistles, there's 49 mentions. So Romans through Colossians. In the seventh epistle, there's seven mentions in seven verses. In the last 14 epistles, there's 77 mentions. Um, in John's epistles plus Revelation, so 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, and Revelation, there's 49 mentions. Um, I mean, there's just there's just so much here. You just what do you do with all this information? You just it's just so perfect. In the first 12 books, there's seven times seven times seven verses that mention either, either Father and Son. In the first seven books that are after the Gospels, so from Acts uh, to what would that be it's Philippians, there's seven times seven verses. So all of that happens within like this. This in itself is miraculous. This in itself is miraculous. But it's not just that. It's all of this. Like, how, how can you possibly look at this and think that that's just all randomly happening? <laughs> There's just no way. Um, so that's, that's my favorite pattern in the Bible. And I haven't even gotten into, like, the Godhead where Father or the Father, the Word, Holy Ghost, 777 mentions. I mean, there's just so much. I can't, even, I can't get into all of it. But um, I want to get into this Daniel 70th week. Um, this is another one with God in the New Testament books. In the epistles, 777 mentions. In the historical books, from Matthew to Acts, 70 times 7 mentions. And then Revelation 99. Um, so think about this in, like, if I were to just to show you one of these, like, one of these, like, patterns, but I didn't show you anything else, you might think it's a random chance. But when you start kind of looking at all this together, this is beyond supercomputer. Like this is, this, like, I started, like I said in the beginning, like this is laser precision surgical math that is unprecedented. And I'm yeah. only scratching the surface. I can't show you everything. <laughs> you think we're seeing this because of computers? I mean, we, we might never have caught this if it wasn't the time in history that we're in. Where we have the computers to find it, right? This is it. That's exactly right. Like, you have to realize that. Um, so most Christians, they look at the Bible like, <clears throat> okay, so God inspired like Moses and the prophets to write the Bible, and it was perfect then. But then men had to copy it, so it lost its perfection over time. But I don't know where they don't like. Okay, it's God's word. He said he's going to preserve it forever himself. And he will. We can believe him on that. And if we look at this from God's perspective, where God is outside of our time, he can, when, when Moses is writing the scriptures or Isaiah is writing the scriptures or, you know, the Holy Ghost is inspiring Moses to write, God doesn't just see Isaiah writing that or Moses writing that and say, okay, here's the perfect word of God and it'll just deteriorate now. God's word does not, is not subject to entropy. Entropy is where everything is going into higher disorder over time. It's like everything is breaking down. Systems collapse over time. God's word is the opposite of entropy because God can see the end from the beginning. So when Isaiah is writing that word of scripture, God is seeing where that word is ending up. And he knows the thoughts of every single scribe, of every single translator, where that word is going to go through and where it's going to hit the paper and eventually land into this final standardized Bible. And think of it from God's perspective. When Isaiah is writing this, how many people are going to get to, to read the book of Isaiah in Isaiah's time? Now look at, from God's perspective, how many people are going to get to read the book of Isaiah in 2023? So you have about what, like maybe like 10, 20,000 people reading the book of Isaiah in Isaiah's time at most. Now you have millions of people. And if God has a choice, which one am I going to give the absolute, like which one am I going to purify seven times and just show my perfection and do all this in, which one is it going to be? God has the choice. He can pick. He can pick which side of history his word is perfect in. And he picked both. <laughs> he picked this one to, to show us with computers that everything, I mean, I'm telling you, this is just scratching the surface. Like I... <laughs> I don't believe I found almost like like anything like and I I guarantee I mean just the things that I have found I am showing you like two percent right now, mm -hmm. so. Anyways, 
Um, I wanted to show if you want to ask me any questions or say anything, just let me know. I'm just kind of. Yeah. Going. So I'm going to jump in. I mean, John 17, 17, right? Sanctify them through the truth. Thy word is truth. Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. he, like you said, I mean, he can use Satan's devices, technology and AI to, to glorify himself. And we're seeing mm -hmm. this as a beautiful example of it. But uh, Robert, you have anything but add before he jumps in? I'm, I'm just, I just keep thinking how amazing God is. And I think our God is way smarter than a computer. Amen. <laughs> and the Bible says we'll have the mind of Christ. So when we get to heaven, we'll, We'll look back at this and we'll be like, dude, we were so dumb because we only got like 0.5%. So, and someday we'll know so much. It'll just, wow. So I, it's, but even this is incredible. I mean, how could you say the King James Bible isn't God's word with just this evidence that we've seen tonight? It proves God wrote that book. Amen. 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 Go ahead. Yeah. So, okay. So the basically what I was I was praying to God about what I should kind of prepare for this, for this live stream. And Jason was like, you know, I want to talk about end time stuff. I was like, okay, well, do you have any end time stuff we can look at, like asking God? And I feel like we do. Um, <clears throat> it has to do with Daniel's 70th week. So most people are probably familiar with it. But it's um, detailed here in Daniel 9.24. It says, Daniel 7, or, sorry, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. So I don't know about anybody else, but whenever I've read this, I'm like, how much of this is like fulfilled already? Because obviously the 70th week hasn't happened yet. We're haven't gone through the, the tribulation yet. Um, the 70th week where <clears throat> Jesus returns and standing on the Mount of Olives. So how much of this is fulfilled? Is any fulfilled? Like some of these definitely seem like they've been fulfilled. Like, I don't know, like, but I thought, I just wanted to kind of throw this out there and let you guys talk about it if you want. Um, but what I did was I looked up the 70 times seventh mention of Christ. And I looked up the 70 times seventh mention of Jesus. And when you look at both of these, well, let me just pull up my other file. <clears throat> okay, so this is just something I just quickly put together. So it was not like too crazy or it's kind of scattered a little bit. But um, if you look at the 70 times seventh mention of Jesus, it's in John eleven thirteen, 13. And if you look at the 70 times seventh mention of Christ, it's in Hebrews 9, 24. Now, right away, that was interesting to me because Hebrews 9, 24 is like directly matches Daniel 9, 24. And Hebrews 9.24 says, For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. So I thought that was pretty interesting because um, it's dealing with anointing the most holy. Um, and that's talking about the heavenly like tabernacle, like God, Jesus in the, the, the holy of holies, the most holy place. Um, so anyways, I was just thinking about that. That's interesting. Um, cause it says, um, let's see here in Hebrews 9, 24, actually that would be, let's see, 9, 26. So just a couple of verses later, it says, nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest entered into the holy place every year with blood of others. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once in the end of the world, hath he appeared, uh, to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Um, and one of the things in Daniel 9 is to make an end of sins. So he doesn't make an end of sins to like everything, but he makes an end of sins to us like individually in our spirit. Uh, I think it's in First John where like we cannot sin. I don't think I have that verse here. Um, anyways, um, Romans says the righteousness of God that the law is manifested being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by the faith of Jesus Christ. Unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference, uh, for all of sin and false over the glory of God. Uh, and um, it says, and to bring in everlasting righteousness. Well, Jesus Christ, I would believe, is the everlasting righteousness. Um, and then 
2 Corinthians 5.18, and all things are of God who reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, given to us the ministry of reconciliation. And one of the things was and to make a reconciliation for iniquity. So anyways, it seems like it's like either partially fulfilled or it's like fulfilled in heaven, but not fully in earth or something. And then I looked in um, a Jesus with the 70 times seventh mention of Jesus. And this is dealing with the actual like earthly fulfillment uh, because it takes you right to the story of Lazarus. Um, <clears throat> so this is the 70 times seventh mention of Jesus. It says, how be it Jesus spake of his death. But they thought that he had spoken of taking of rest in sleep. Um, so this is where it gets kind of deep, not too deep, but kind of interesting. Um, <laughs> this is, to me, it was really fascinating going through this. Basically, um, most people know the story of Lazarus where Jesus raises him after he was dead for four days. And one of the interesting details about Lazarus, and I believe Lazarus is a type of Israel, being revived for the millennial kingdom. And I'm going to show you why. Um, so it says, uh, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. When he heard, therefore, that he was sick, he abode two days still in the same place where he was. So Jesus, this detail is, <laughs> is just randomly in there, I guess. It's not random. Uh, Jesus decides to abide in the same place for two days after he hears his information about Lazarus being sick. and we know that a day to the Lord is a thousand years. So I'm going to use this reference twice, but um, 2 Peter 3, 8, one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and as a thousand years is one day. Jesus waits in the same place for two days before coming back to revive Lazarus. Um, and of course, with you know, Jesus has been on the right hand of God for 2,000 years, for two days in God's sight. Uh, he's going to come back and he's going to uh, 70th week will begin. Um, so let's see here. And then Hosea 6 says in verse 2, after two days will he revive us, and the third day he will raise us up, and we shall live in his sight. So Jesus abides two days. Um, so coming down through this, uh, what's also interesting is that right before the 70 times seventh mention of Jesus is the 70, 70 times seventh verse of the book of John. Like it's literally like right beside each other. So there's after this verse, that's the next the next mention of Jesus is the seventy times seventh mention. Um, so the book of John, John eleven eleven is seventy times seventh verse. Um, These things said he, and after that he saith unto them, Our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go that I may awake him out of sleep. And what does Israel have the spirit of right now? They have the spirit of slumber. They're sleeping. According as it is written, God hath given them the spirit of slumber. This is Romans 11, dealing with Israel. Um, eyes that they should not see and ears that they should not hear unto this day. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> so God, so Jesus literally just keeps referring it to sleeping. His disciples are even confused about it. Like, what are you talking about? And he's like, then he plainly tells them, Lazarus is dead. I am glad for your sakes that I was not there to the intent you may believe. Nevertheless, let us go unto him. Um then said Thomas, which is called Didymus, unto his fellow disciples, let us go also let us also go that we may die with him. Thomas is, I mean, this I don't have time to get into this, but type of the tribulation saint, uh, tribulation saint. Um, and then uh, let's see here. Then when Jesus came, he found that he had lain in the grave four days already. So now we have four days. And Jacob, so you know, son of Isaac, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob was born back there 2,000 years before Christ. So a total of four days or 4,000 years we have from Jacob, basically Jacob living and dying, until the, the millennium kingdom. So Lazarus being a type of Jacob in the grave for four days points to Israel, to Jacob himself, and all of his seed with him. Um also, uh, just the fact that um, this Lazarus's tomb, it's interesting because I think I have a map somewhere. Jesus is going to stand on the Mount of Olives when he returns, the 70 times 7th week, the end of the 70 times 7. We're all dealing with this. We're dealing with the 70 times 7th week. If you look at the Mount of Olives and the, the tomb where Jesus was buried in and then the tomb of Lazarus, which uh, I've looked into that, I'm pretty confident those are the actual places. Uh, the earth is going to split from like east to west 
And it might just be that it kind of hits them both like that because there's like a fault line or something like that that kind of goes in that direction. Um, so kind of interesting how it's kind of all connecting. Um, and that this is the 70 times seventh mention of Jesus in the middle of all this. Um, so then uh, it even says, uh, where is it? Um, Martha is saying to Jesus, I know that even now, whatsoever thou ask of God, God will give it thee. Jesus saith unto her, thy brother shall rise again. Martha saith unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection of the last day. And Jesus uh, doesn't deny that. He just says, Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. <clears throat> so there's just so many things pointing to the 70 times seventh week. Um, Jesus weeps for Lazarus. And I, uh, I would think that's God's love for Israel being pictured. Um, and also, I'm not taking away from the actual events. Like this is an actual thing. Jesus rose Lazarus from the dead. There's, this is just what it seems like. It's the prophetic picture of what's happening. So after four days, he rises him up, uh, and then Lazarus come forth, and then eventually Israel will be saved. So all Israel shall be saved, as it is written. There shall come out of Zion the deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sins. So there's Daniel's 70th week showing up at the end of, uh, showing up for Israel, at least at the end of the 70 times 7. So I just thought it was kind of interesting how the 70 times 7 mention of Christ is kind of like dealing with the church almost, it seems, but also Israel. And then this one is definitely dealing with like the prophetic picture of Israel. And 70 times 7 is obviously the big number of Daniel's 70 weeks. Um, so I just, stumbled across all this. Um, <clears throat> and uh, this was interesting as well. Um, so with Hebrews 9.24 and Daniel 9.24, if, um, if you look at, <clears throat> so Christ in the Bible shows up 555 times, which is a lot of interesting things about it. It would take too long to get into. But if you look at the 55th mention, so 55 out of 555, it will take you to John 9. Let's see here, John 9, 22. This is probably too small to read, but it, search result 55 out of 555. Uh, John 9 is the 77th chapter of the New Testament. And uh, let's see here. Uh, it's this, um, this mention of Christ is the 490 word of that 77th chapter. So 490, 70 times 7. And um, this is when John 9 is when Jesus is healing the blind person. Another picture of Israel being on their spiritually blind and he's opening their eyes. And, um, yeah, anyways. So, yeah, I just kind of uh, picked that up like yesterday or no, like four days ago, I started picking up on this one or on Christ. And then today, actually, I just decided to look up Jesus because there's usually like with patterns, you'll see like there's there's like confirmation of it. Like it's not just one, it's both. So I thought that was an interesting uh, setup, uh, interesting way that God laid that out. And both of it seems to be pointing at Daniel 70th week in some way, shape or form. But uh, like I said in the beginning, like when I look at Daniel 70th week, I'm like, which ones of these are fulfilled and which ones aren't and which ones are going to be fulfilled. So I don't know if you have any comments on that or anything, but um, I was just kind of my research on it. And uh, haven't really put too much extra thought into it until now. I got nothing. <laughs> I mean, it's definitely interesting. You know, so, and, and there are types in the Bible, right? So, I mean, there's a bunch of different types in the Bible for different, different. you know, there's a type for people that are raptured and don't die, uh, Enoch. And there's a type, you know, Moses represents a different type of the people in the tribulation compared to Elijah. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of different types that you, you can see. And, and I think you did a good job of showing a type in the Bible essentially, but what, what, in terms of what you said is completed. I mean, obviously to make an end to sins that, that hasn't happened. Um, you know, people sin all the time to finish the transgression while well, Israel is, if in terms of Israel, they're still, they haven't repented, right? That, that's, you know, Jesus wants to gather the nation of Israel back to him just like he wants to gather the nations to destroy him in the tribulation and then put this, you know, take his wrath on, on, on the world. But, uh, 
so that I don't think I don't really think any of these have happened except to seal up the vision and prophecy. I think that one's definitely happened because John was the last prophet. And of course the Bible always anoints the most holy. So, you know, that's always, but I don't know. It, it's interesting. You know, the millennial kingdom will be fulfilled and that's the day that God, the father looks the most forward to it. I see Jesus Christ get his rightful place, you know, as King of all Kings down here on the earth. But uh, that, that was a great study, Brandon. Yeah. <clears throat> So it was interesting. I mean, there's so, so many things that when you look at this, it's like a lot of the times it's like, especially, especially when I first started looking into these things, um, like when I started looking into the sevens and stuff, that's when I realized I was like, I knew God's perfect number of seven all along, but why didn't I just look for that in the first place? And I was like, help my unbelief. Like the, the more you, the more you realize if I just would have, I mean, this is just, it's just there if you just look for it. But never would have. You have to have the the faith to actually like look and believe that it could be that perfect. And then once you like, it is a very faith building for me at least. And I hope it builds others' faith as well. Um, one of the you know the biggest reason I do it is to to continue that is um, like I want I want people to get saved. I want to whether that's they it gets their interest in the Bible or. Uh, somehow God uses it to draw them in. Um, I've tried to put the gospel in the end of my videos um, wh or whether it's just strengthening the faith of somebody who isn't, uh, you know, solid, like, you know, is every word of God perfect or not? I feel like kind of after going through this, you don't have to doubt anymore. Like there's just no way. Um, so, um yeah, and at first it was just research, but it's almost, I mean, at this point, it's it's, it's, uh, it's almost like a calling, and it's a weird calling, and it's probably the least of all callings. Like, I'm not out there, like, preaching the gospel or feeding the, the homeless or taking care of the sick. It's, it's just knowledge, but I hope it's a blessing to other people, and um, I, hope, I hope God gets the glory for it, and I hope it brings other people to Christ. Um, but at, yeah, at first it was just, you know, it's kind of research and now it's, it's kind of more than that. Like this is like serious business. This is de dealing with the most important thing we have um, in our possession. So yeah, I mean, someone was, <laughs> I don't even know if I should share this. This is just wild to me, but um, what does it say in Ephesians about uh Ephesians 2, um, <clears throat> for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. So we're the workmanship of God, created unto good works. Um, okay, so this just this past week I found this out. Someone was asking me, like I said, people started asking me for my testimony this week out of nowhere, and I wanted to look up. <clears throat> I wanted to look. <laughs> this is gonna make me sound like so like big. I I don't want this to make put this about me at all. Like I don't I don't even know, understand this yet, but. I went to look up like how old I was when I got saved, just out of curiosity, like how many months or years it was. And like I said, I don't know the exact day that I'm saved, but I know like the range of within like a week or two. And when I went to look up that number, it basically was from the time I was born to the day I was born again. It was 7,777 days. And I was like, what is going on? And I was like, I read this verse very shortly after. We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus into good works. And I was like, there's nothing I did to do that. Like, I've, I never thought of that. I never look at stuff for myself. I'm only looking at God and his word. I'm only looking at Jesus. I'm only trying to find stuff about him. And that's really weird. But it was at that point, I was like, maybe God has called me to do this for real. Like, before ordained. So I don't know, but maybe it's just a coincidence. It was just the weirdest thing ever I found this week, and I've never 
I'm not going to continue looking for things for myself because I'm nothing. I'm a speck of dust. Jesus is everything. And I don't encourage people to look for things like that for yourself. It's just, it was just weird. Um, but anyways, that's been kind of hanging on me for a while. And it's like, <clears throat> wow. Well, God does numbers and God is the God of numbers. What's the fourth book of the Bible? It's called numbers. So it's numbers. <laughs> definitely something to that, right? Amen. And it's exactly 777 chapters away from Matthew 1. How about that? It's this is perfect. There. How can anyone <laughs> deny God is real if he wrote a book like this? It's just, wow. Give goosebumps. How about you, Jason? Oh, you know what? It, God's word is awesome, right? Um, Matthew 24, 35, he says, my word shall not pass away, right? And, and they're preserved in the perfect Bible and the perfect universal language. I, I did a video today just talking about, you know, how God used that Philadelphia and church age, the 1611 time period to produce the perfect word and to then spread the Bible out over the world, much like I believe that um, the early missions and that came out of Antioch did with the Greek language, uh, you know, things parallel that way. And, um, you know, Greenwich, England, you have the prime meridian, right? So if you don't, you don't know your location on earth without knowing the prime meridian location, it divides Eastern and Western hemisphere. It's zero, you know, zero degrees, you know, um, and time is what Greenwich mean time, you know, so, and that's based on how often the sun crosses over that prime meridian line. And so of course the universal language is English and, and out goes the Bible. And, um, you know, I know Robert Breaker did a good video on collation, you know, about, uh, you know, how the, how the, uh, the writers of the KJV, their committees looked at, you know, all the, the manuscripts they had and, and had right. no bias and, and, and a scientific method, but, you know, just seeing God's math and, and, and the, be and the beauty of our Lord Jesus Christ and how, I, you know, I think what Brandon, one of the, one of the videos, I think that or was something I saw in one of your videos was where Jesus sevens himself. He swears himself. Uh, and the, how they're close in the Hebrew, they're back to back words in the Hebrew dictionary wow. and they almost look exactly the same. So when G, when, when the word is what sworn or swear in the Bible, he sevens himself and that happens seven times. Hmm. You can't, you can't make that stuff up. Hmm. <clears throat> yeah. One of the interesting things as well, I just found the past week was, um, I was just curious, um, so one thing I already knew was, so there's 39 books in the Old Testament and 27 in the New Testament. <clears throat> so if you would go to Genesis 1-1 uh, and you go plus 39, 27 verses, it takes you to Numbers 7, 77, which is interesting. But this past week, what I did was I did Genesis 1-1 plus 16, 11 verses, and it'll take you, um, here, let me share my screen again so I can just show how to do okay. this. Um See this one. <clears throat> okay, so Genesis one. So if you do like hit the command or control G, it pulls this little box up, and then you can click switch to relative mode, and then you can type in the amount of verses you want to skip ahead. So if I did uh, thirty nine twenty seven, it takes you to number seven seventy seven. But interestingly, if you go to sixteen eleven verses ahead, it takes you to Ex Exodus four ten, which says, "And Moses said unto the Lord." Oh, my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither heretofore nor since thou hast spoken unto thy servant, but I am slow of speech and of a slow tongue. And I, was, I looked up, is English a slow language? And it's Ooh. literally like behind like Mandarin. It's the slowest language in the world. Ooh. Like everybody else, like the way that how fast they speak. And so yeah. I was like, wow, that's pretty interesting. <laughs> I wonder if there's anything to that. But um. <clears throat> Anyways, yeah, it was pretty pretty cool. The wow. 16, 16, 11 verse from the end of the Bible is also interesting. Let me see if I can do that one. You know, King James had an, an oversized tongue and had a Did he? With speech. So that's I didn't know that. Too. Yep. That is interesting. Yeah, I had no idea about that. Hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, I feel like it go backwards. So if I type in 16, 11, and then reverse direction. Take me backwards. Um, so this will be, uh, wherefore I made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God, 
even the mystery which has been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints. <clears throat> Pretty crazy. That's crazy. That so, is so crazy. If anybody has a question, um, you can. Oh yeah. <laughs> you can. You did, but if you would type in question, or you can at one of us, if you want. We we do have some some moderators who who might bring forth the questions, but we can look for them too. Be a good time to ask them. Whoever you want to ask questions to. So Brandon, I'm assuming you were about finished. I don't I don't know. Oh yeah. I mean I I'm open to all questions because I I can keep going can, forever. Yeah, and then we can we could always of course jump in and talk about any, any of the topics they bring up. <clears throat> another another interesting one is um the hundred and fifty three fishes. Cause uh Peter is the one who draws in those great fishes. And then Peter is uh, mentioned in 153 verses, um, and then wow. Paul. Paul is um, so. Just I mean, just go to Galatians 2 7. It'll tell you Galatians 2 7. When they saw the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me, Paul, as the gospel of the circumcision was committed unto Peter. Um, if you look at Paul, he is also mentioned in 100, 153 verses. Nobody else in the Bible but the, the two main fishers of men are mentioned in 153 verses where wow. the gospel is committed to them. And so I can even type it in and show you. So Peter, 153. Uh, and then, I mean, okay, so, and that get, just gets you thinking, Paul, 153. That gets you thinking, why would John write? that number down like why would he record how many fishes there were like why did it matter to him and this is just proof that god is like inspiring him to do these i mean yeah. when he wrote the book of john which some people believe was like in like 90 a.d what 60 years after they caught the fish or something like that how does he keep that number in his brain for that long and why would he jot that thing down it's like yeah. something i believe god kept that number in his heart to just mark it down and specifically i mean many people have wondered over that number like why would that just randomly be there but it's not random and nothing's random in the bible it's right. literally a signature of the gospel first corinthians 5 3 1 5 3 153 yeah amen <laughs> this is getting better and better amen um if anyone comes with a question let me know but I can go with more stuff of this. Preach. All mentions of preach is 153. Um, <clears throat> so that includes, let's see, that includes like everything. Preach, preacher, preacher, preachers, preacher, preaching. Um, let me check my notes because I know there's more. Oh, um, the sun, when you look at it, case sensitive like this will be, I believe it's in 153 verses, just like Peter and Paul. Yep. <clears throat> um, oh, another another interesting one is uh, the gospel is preached unto Abraham. So if you look up Abraham, Isaac, uh, Jacob, and then Judah. You get 1,530 mentions, or 153 times 10. And this is really weird. This is crazy because when you look into this, Judah in the New Testament is usually spelled like without that H. But there is one time where it includes the H out of nowhere, and it's like, well, was that a is that a, a typo, or is it that God purposely leave like a couple mentions of Judah? Or is it there's one I think? Let me just narrow this down to the New Testament. So let me disable these other ones. There, one time Hebrews eight eight, for out of nowhere Judah has an H on the end of it in the New Testament. It's like why? Even uh, by the way, let me know if there's any questions. Um, but it, for example, Jesus Christ, I was showing you all these um. These are different things. Jesus Christ, where it says he mentioned T seven times seven times, so it's one hundred ninety six times. There are multiple places in the King James Bible where it deviates from the Greek. 
where the Greek will say Christ Jesus in that order, the King James, for whatever reason, will make it Jesus Christ. Literally for no reason at all, other than, I guess, make, to make it sound more poetic or whatever they had in mind. But it deviates from the Greek. And because of these deviations, and I've noticed in many of these different patterns, there's deviations from the Greek. Because of those little deviations, it allows all this to happen. And with, with if it would just exactly follow the Greek, the way that it is verbatim in the Greek, it wouldn't happen like this. It would like this wouldn't look like this at all. And most of it would be broken. You wouldn't have many of these things divisible by seven. Yeah. Um, it's amazing. So it's a unique book. It's it's superseded the Hebrew and the Greek. Exactly. <clears throat> I believe that too. Yeah, amen yeah. to that. I 100% agree with that. Any questions for Brandon? I got a question. What's the difference between the Holy Ghost and Holy Spirit? Oh man, I mean, some people think it's different. I I think it's the same. <laughs> but um, okay, so Holy Spirit is mentioned seven times. Yeah, let me let me actually pull this up in my uh, let me pull this up in my book because I have a whole note on this. So. Okay, Holy Ghost or Holy Spirit. So this is from my book on page 140. <clears throat> um, so I didn't go over this one, I don't think, but there are 777 mentions of the Father, the Word, and Holy Ghost. Uh, and then uh, Robert pointed this one out with Jehovah, Word, capitalized, and Holy Spirit. Um, in the Greek, it's the same, Holy Ghost and Holy Spirit. If you look at the Greek, it's spelled the exact same way. Uh, so why is it differentiated here in the English? Um, if it was, if one of those mentions was one of those mentions of Holy Spirit was Holy Ghost or vice versa, then all these patterns break with this and with the 777 mentions of the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. All those patterns would break if for <laughs> somehow they, you know. Anyways, okay, so uh, let's hear God and Spirit together show up. 49, 49 times in the Bible, when you look at both of them. But one of these mentions of, um, where do I have this at? I have this somewhere. <clears throat> one of those mentions of Holy Spirit is, uh, it's fully capitalized. And it's both Holy and Spirit are capitalized. And it only happens in the fourth mention out of the seven. And uh, I do have a note on that somewhere. Let me find it real quick. <clears throat> There we go. <clears throat> okay. So there's only one time where both holy and spirit are capitalized. And again, a scholar would look at that and say, why is there inconsistency? Or, you know, that even he would even say maybe like it's an error that these are not capitalized down here and they should be. That's the middle um, one. Wow. Right. It's just the middle one. And it's interesting because because only that one has both of them capitalized, that's the only one where perfectly matches Holy Ghost, which is always both capitalized. You know, there is no Holy Ghost, whereas lowercase holy. It's always uppercase, you know, capitalized holy, capitalized ghost. So immediately that kind of puts it in its category where you can say this one right here, and then Holy Ghost, you can put them together. And then when you do, it, they're divisible by seven, seven times 13 mentions, which means all of them when it capitalized. So Father, Son, I already went over these in the figma thing uh and then holy ghost holy spirit and then when you add jesus christ to all those mentions and that's just looking at that one mention of holy spirit because it's the only one that's fully capitalized when you add jesus christ you get 777 total mentions of father son holy ghost or holy spirit and then jesus christ um yeah so i thought it was pretty interesting <clears throat> very cool uh, just one of them is made me Very think cool. of seven golden candlesticks. And how that's dude, that's what I thought. You know, the mm -hmm. one in the middle. Wow, that's interesting. He's I think in the there's even more of the candlesticks. Wow, there was something about that, something about the verses, the way they're set up. Where I was thinking the exact same thing as you, but I don't remember what it was anymore. So, think of this God had to use the translators to do this, it wasn't an accident. But God also used a man 
to put the verse numbers, the chapter and verse numbers. Yeah. And the fact that they're in there, and I can't remember who did it. I know there's a Bible note in mine. It was in the 1500s, I believe, where a guy yeah. added those in. So God is behind the scenes <clears throat> using man to do these things. And it cannot be denied. I mean, it's just, wow. <laughs> it's amazing. Not. And actually, I don't know. M many people don't know this, but King James Bible set the standard for verse divisions because uh, all the Bibles before that, so Geneva, even the Dewey Reams in 1610, had slightly different verse divisions. Sure. And like the end of like Second Corinthians, um, and I think like one other book, I have a document somewhere as well. But in 1611, that's where it became fully standardized. Like the verse divisions were set in stone, and now even the modern versions conform to it, even if they delete verses. Um, <clears throat> Got a question from Dexter. Does the Hebrew of Old Testament change anything in terms of what you're doing, Brandon? Well, I started off by studying the Hebrew, um, and there's definitely patterns in the Hebrew. The thing is, with the Hebrew, it's not like the King James Bible. We can say this is the final text. Some verses in Hebrew is spelled differently depending on the manuscripts, and you don't have a final Hebrew manuscript to look at. So how are you going to definitively say that how can you definitively look at all these different things in the Hebrew? Now, there are definitely things. For example, in Genesis 1 1, that's still the same in all the Hebrew manuscripts. And there are huge patterns in that in Genesis 1 1 that will even connect with like John 1 1 and the name of Jesus Christ. Um, and one of my first videos was called Thy Word Be Verified. I compared like Hebrew and Greek and English and how those patterns just kind of carried over and they just match, showing like the same author. Um, so I have nothing against the Hebrew. I'm just telling, I'm just saying the English has superseded it. So, and I think for a good reason, the world speaks English. The world doesn't speak Hebrew. And God, like I said, he can see both sides of history. Which one is he going to pick to give us absolute perfect Bible to? Where it's being, it's not only like, uh, I mean, it, it's reproducible, it's printable, like, it's mass publishable. You like, you can print it out in in like how many copies can you print out in one day? Where in those times you had to manually write. It would take months and months and months just to get one Bible finished. So now we have it all. We have a standard text. If anybody changes a word of it, we're going to know because we have everything counted. We have everything perfectly matched. We have databases, and our databases aren't going to change. So if you change something in your database, we can compare that. Um, like. Yeah, I mean, the the founder of this program, King James Pure Bible Search, she is a complete genius. Uh, I don't know, like she is so smart. <clears throat> but um, she even has, um, I think I have it on here as well, a database for the Pure Cambridge Edition, which is a whole other thing. Uh, so the Pure Cambridge Edition is um, PCE. It's uh, promoted by a guy called Bible Protector. Um, <clears throat> And it's printed by some publishers today, like Church Bible Publishers and Holman Prince, this one. But literally, like all the patterns, like we he, we can see that there's no difference. Like there's the only difference in wording is one little word in Exodus 23, 23 has an extra word and in the Pure Cambridge edition. Every single other word is the exact same. All the patterns will carry over. The only other major difference would be... Um, uh, some capitalizations of spirit, some are lowercase and some are capitalized between this one and the other, King James. So all these major patterns, though, whether it's an Oxford or a Cambridge or, you know, your Walmart dollar store, all of these main patterns will be there. And I think that in itself is like God's signature over it. I mean, even if the printer accidentally, uh, you know, mistypes a word or misspells a word, or something gets deleted by accident, these patterns are still there. The Holy Spirit is still working through the book, uh, no matter who, who prints it, who publishes it. Now, unless it's like really corrupted, I don't like when printers take it upon themselves to like trying to change things and making it easy to understand. That's a different thing. Um, but uh, yeah, for me, pretty much any King James Bible you buy, you're not gonna have, like you're gonna have all these patterns in there. <clears throat> right. Um, yep. So uh, Doug Finn has a question. Are there any evil triple six cross references in any of these? Uh, that yeah. You've seen? 
Okay, so interesting one. If you look at the 666 mention of Jesus, um, it's not an evil cross, it's not an evil reference. It's an interesting <laughs> one. Um, let me find it. I'm trying to think if it's the, if it's with singular or singular and possessive mentions. It's, uh, it would be this one then, I think. Uh, yeah, where is it? Is it with anti mentions? It probably is. Hey, hold on. I have it in my notes. <clears throat> if I All right. While he's looking for that, um, is the Church of Laodicea the people that are God's are at God's throne in Revelation chapter seven? Well, chapter seven is one hundred forty four, uh, and the, and Gentile saints in the tribulation nine on and on down. So. Uh, there's there's no doubt during the tribulation the Christians are going to be in the third heaven with the with, with the Lord, but the Christians are are not the hundred and forty four thousand. Amen. When you read the text of that chapter and you see that who are these and he says they are they that came out of great tribulation. So those are people that would have been beheaded in the tribulation period for not taking the mark. Yep. So the church gets out in chapter four at the rapture. We're oh, going wow. through verse of verse by verse through Revelation now. And so see the verse by verse and you'll get that. I had that question earlier today, so that's interesting. Yeah. <clears throat> I was uh my issue was it's not the six hundred sixty six mention, it's the six hundred sixty six verse where you mentioned. So I'm trying to find that real quick. <clears throat> cool. Okay. While you're looking, I just I'm amazed how God hides the numbers in, in the books. He hides the numbers in the verses. You're going through the sentences and, and even looking at words and how God uses that. And then there's another thing called gematria, where every word has so-called number meanings in it, too. So no matter how you look at it, God has hidden mathematics and everything. It's just incredible. And yeah. uh, I wish I were smarter. Math is not my forte. <laughs> but if you understood math, you can, how, how do you deny it? Was it which book was it um, that if you looked at it in the Hebrew and you counted every fifth letter or something like that, it spelled out the name of God over and over and over? You know what I'm talking about? You remember that? I forget if it was Deuteronomy or it was it was the Torah, but every something like fifth letter was one of the letters of God. Mm, so yeah. And mm -hmm. his name was literally in the Hebrew text, and it was mathematically there over and over and over and over. I mean, it's everywhere. How could anyone be an agnostic? How could anyone be an atheist? They clearly haven't studied. And the Bible says, study to show thyself approved unto God. And I think God's approving of us all right now, isn't he? Because we've Amen. studied this and, and we're seeing this. And we just want to see people get saved because this proves God is real. Amen. Yeah, amen. And uh, I found it. <clears throat> so this is the 666 verse where Jesus is mentioned. Look at all mentions of Jesus. Then Paul answered, what mean ye to weep and to break mine heart? For I am ready not to be bound only, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. <clears throat> That's a 666 verse to mention Jesus. Um, the 666 chapter of the Bible has, that's Ecclesiastes 7, has the verse where it says, Behold this, have I found, say the preacher, counting one by one to find out the account. Mm -hmm. And this is the 666th mention of behold, which is really interesting. Um, there is <clears throat> two, the only two references of chapter and verse that where that forms 666 six, six in the New Testament would be Matthew 26, 66. So we have the three sixes. And where it says, what think ye? They answered and said, he is guilty of death. And then John 66, verse 666, from that time, any of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. A lot of people know that one. Um, Mar the book of Mark in new versions of the Bible, a lot of people know this as well, but uh, Mark of the Beast, 666. In the book of Mark, the gospel of Mark, um, there's a little line that goes across the page, and it says, Mark uh, 16, 9 through 20 are not 
in the oldest manuscripts and basically making you cast doubt that these verses are not actually inspired. And those are the verses, that's the very end of Mark that deals with his resurrection, his appearing, and then it's the only time in the Gospels where he ascends to the right hand of God and actually describes that in the Gospels. So without those verses, the book of Mark would have exactly 666 verses. And new Bibles say, this is, these are the ones you should cut out. These are the ones I warn in the oldest manuscripts. And if that's true, you're left with a book of Mark that has 666 verses taking out Jesus's ascension to the throne of God. And what does Lucifer want to do? He wants to, he wants God's throne. That's what he wants. Yep. And he's taking that out where Jesus <laughs> ascends yep. to the throne. The only time in the gospels. There's a couple of different things that are interesting with Nero and 666 because Nero shows up in the very last. Uh, so in second Timothy, this is a rabbit hole. Um, second Timothy begins on verse number 6666 of the New Testament. So um, in total, the book of 2 Timothy has 1,666 words. And then at the very end of the postscript, you see um, Nero being mentioned um, right here. And a lot of people view him as the you know, big type of the Antichrist. Um, and it's really weird is, this is totally out of context, but it's still interesting. If you look at count all these words up here, like from the end of the ver end of the, end of the chapter, end of the book, um, if you count up uh, six times six times six words, uh, it'll take you. Uh, let me find it. Take you to right here. It says take Mark. Mm -hmm. So I have no idea. I mean, it's just it might be a coincidence, but <clears throat> I think there was something else. That's not a coincidence. Mark. <laughs> no. God pointing to it. But yeah, it shows you new versions of the Bible are corrupt, too. Amen, brother. Amazing. What's the difference between the day of the Lord and the day of Christ? Oh, well, that, gets us, that gets us into a long discussion. Yeah, I want to make it. We're going to make it real short. Day of Christ yeah. is. Uh, when at the rapture of the church, Jesus Christ comes back. It's also the judgment seat of Christ. I think it's a, a dual thing. Um, and the day of the Lord. Well, there, you, you know, it's definitely it's going to be second, uh, second advent, battle of Armageddon. And Old Testament also brings up the day of the Lord and some of the wrath there. But uh, they're, they're definitely two different things. Sure. Uh, a lot of people get confused and think they're the same. So that's it. That's the end of that. <laughs> we can keep going on that. But I think I have a video on that on YouTube about the day of Christ versus the day of the Lord. Lots of Old Testament verses on the day of the Lord being a day of gloom and darkness, and and it all ties into the Battle of Armageddon and then Jesus ruling for a thousand years. So, amen. Hey, Robert Breaker, you got a question. Logan Fish asks you in particular: Does John MacArthur teach Calvinism? Does John MacArthur teach Calvinism? Well, he he tells people he's a Calvinist, so I guess he does. I I mean, he tells everyone he's a Calvinist. Um, a Calvinism is basically lordship salvation, and that sounds like what the man teaches. So, um, you know, uh, sounds like it to me. I mean, a rose by any other name is still the same. <laughs> you know. Amen. Well, we got a couple questions about the rapture. One is Roy sent him. Will the will the rapture happen this year? And I think Repo Man asked when the rapture will be. Well, Lord willing, the rapture will happen this year, but the Lord will come when the Lord is ready to come. Amen. And we just keep watching and, you know, we, we love the Lord. We want his return to come as soon as possible, but you know, it's up to him. But I think as time goes on, the clock is getting shorter and shorter. I mean, I, I think that's evident and you never know. What do you think about that guys? Right before this call, I was saying, come Lord Jesus. <laughs> come even still come today. Amen. Yeah. Amen. It's getting worse out there every day. So, um, yeah, definitely, definitely not, uh, not good. Um, I think there was another question I wanted to throw out here. If anybody else sees another, another question in the chat. Oh, can Kevin Burks ask, can someone be saved through the tribulation if they already heard the gospel and have not taken the mark? I assume when he means gospel, he's talking about revelation 14, six, the everlasting gospel and not the gospel of the church age. 
Yeah, let's let's. So there is a different dispensation of salvation. I, you know, sort of two plans, really, right? There's those that get their head cut off, and and you know certainly can't buy and sell unless you take the mark of the beast. So they refuse that and they get their head lopped off. And then there's those that make it through the tribulation and they go to the judgment of the nations, which is the you know the goats and the sheep judgment, where they divide out um, the peoples from the nations, whether they they lived they believed in God and Jesus, and then they and they helped the Jews out or not and help the poor and help and those that didn't do that. So you just get saved today. So you don't have to worry about that question. Please get saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Any, any comments on that guys? No, you said it pretty well. Um, but it, you know, if someone knows the gospel here today and they reject it, they don't go with the rapture. It's that simple. And you're not just going to get saved in the tribulation the same way we do now. It's just not, Paul said, though we are an angel from heaven preaching the other gospel, let him be a curse. Well, in the tribulation, there's an angel in heaven preaching something different. It's not the same. So it's best to get saved today. And I had a great blessing today. A lady called me on the phone and asked me how to get saved. And I was able to lead her to the Lord on the phone. And what Amen. a blessing that was. A Hispanic lady, all in Spanish. And it's just, wow, it's just a blessing that God's still saving people. And um, until he comes, we just need to be preaching the gospel. First Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. Pointing people to faith in the blood because it's the blood of Jesus that saves us and the atonement. I receive the atonement, Romans 5.11. <clears throat> so that's what I want to do. And uh, I'm just excited. And I this has been amazing just looking at all the, the, the things that you cannot call a coincidence. I mean, there comes a time where you can go, oh, okay, well, that's a coincidence. Okay, that after about five or six times, there's no more coincidence. <laughs> <laughs> It's the handprints or fingerprints of the divine God doing all this. And so that's just incredible. Just incredible. My my head is spinning from all the information we got tonight. And I'm just so thankful. And uh so tired too. <laughs> it's getting late. <laughs> is that is that I have a question for you. Is that um you said it was a navy like code breaker or something? Is he still yeah. alive? He as far as I know, his wife passed away and he's really sad, but he hasn't called me in a while. I'm not going to give you his name, but no, you don't need to give me his name. I mean, he's seeing all these things that you're seeing. You I know, know it's crazy. Like I've... <laughs> the computer that I, the, the one that I use is QuickVerse. Or no, in the old days when it first came out, it was QuickVerse, and then I switched to eSword. And I'm not able to find all the good stuff that you are on eSword. Um, you just you've got to know what you're doing. But yeah. he's literally hand counting things. Still, yeah, that's, that's a lot of the things that you've come up with, and it's just wow. And all those all numbers there. are accurate. Yeah, it's all there. And uh, he was he's an amazing guy. I love talking to him when he calls me. Um, just, and he loves the Lord. He's been looking every every year for the Lord's return. And uh, so are we. And the sooner it comes, the better. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine the moment we're raptured? We'll know everything. We'll know what Jesus knows. And uh, wow. We'll look back on this and go, boy, we're so dumb. <laughs> yet we're putting out more truth probably than most Christians in the world have ever heard, you know, pointing people to the right Bible. It's amazing. It's amazing. Got a question on the screen here. Yeah. Yeah. You want to take that one, Robert? We have a craze for universalism. All are saved rising up today. And they're contending that Paul never mentioned hell. What do you think about Paul not mentioning hell? Well, I remember the first book Paul wrote. Well, I think it's Hebrews. But even if that's the case, he said, our God is a consuming fire. And the other people say the first book he wrote was Thessalonians. And didn't it say in flaming fire? I mean, that sounds like hell to me. So he yeah. didn't use the word hell, but he talked about fire and judgment and things like that. Um, but, um, yeah, there's a lot of things that I don't know why Paul didn't do this. or the, the, Paul doesn't often say much about um certain things and i don't know why um so i can't say i think it was known in his day and that's why he didn't mention the same things over and over as much as he did but um i do believe he preached uh, on hell and i believe he's pointing people to the blood atonement of christ justified by faith in the blood not by works and that's the message you know that changed the world twice uh, universalism is the teaching that everybody's going to be saved one day so a lot of people that believe that believe that people that are sinners, they die and go to hell. Well, that's OK. After 20 million years, God will let them out because they paid for their sins. And that's not what the Bible teaches. If you end up in hell, there's no way to get saved now. You need to get saved now. 
Otherwise, you'll be cast into the lake of fire. And that's a sad thing. That's a sad thing. Amen. Ron uh, Sanum asked, will the Antichrist be an Assyrian? I, he'll have Assyrian roots and Jewish roots. Yes, yes I think the Bible shows that. Yep. Um, so, And then D23 asks, is the sixth seal the rapture? We get raptured at Revelation 4, 1, and the sixth seal is much later on. So, so no, none of the seals have been opened yet. Right. I and go back to the Assyrian. Um, Abraham makes an agreement or a concord, uh, a, a covenant with Assyrian in uh, in Genesis, I believe it is. And all throughout the Old Testament, you hear the Assyrian, the Assyrian. You know, there's 18 types of Antichrist in the Bible. That's six plus six plus six. So if you want a fun Bible study, look up my video on the 18 types of Antichrist in the Bible. And you'll see how many times the Assyrian shows up. So, yes, I believe that the... Uh, the Antichrist will probably be part Jewish, part Syrian, or Assyrian. Uh, just too many types in the Bible of that. Any other questions? I think we're gonna we're gonna wrap it up. Um, we were asked to pray for the Turkey and Syria before ending the live. I think that's a really good idea. Um, those poor people went through a lot, and they're still actually getting people out of the rubble. It's hard to believe after that many days, you figured dehydration would, would kick in, but, but the Lord can move and save, save people in the smallest of crevices and spots and tight. And, and it's just amazing, but yeah, we definitely need to pray for those folks. So um, I'll, I'll kick it off and we'll just, each of us will pray before we, we, we head out of here. Mm -hmm. Jesus Christ, thank you for, you know, everything you've done for us. That we don't deserve. And you loved us with all your heart. And you gave your very body to die for us so we could have eternal salvation when we don't deserve it. I pray for those that are lost that um, don't ha know you by name and, and, and aren't saved. I pray for those that are homeless and, and those in Turkey and Syria that are suffering and, and the devastation. And I, and I pray that you can make something good out of that and get people saved. Mm -hmm. I pray that um, each and every one of us here will we'll draw closer to you in these last days. There's, there's a lot of dark forces moving against us and we need to be as close as close to you as possible. And I, I pray for everyone here in this channel and their families that they'll do that in these end times to, to uplift you and to serve you and to give out that gospel message and to love a lost world. Even though we know sometimes that's hard. They, you are long suffering for them to come to salvation. In Jesus name. I pray. Amen. Amen. Lord, we just come to your prayer. We just thank you, God, for this opportunity to come and share your word and talk about it. And Lord, wow. Wow, Lord. And uh, we just thank you, Lord, for that book that you've given us. God, we come to you in prayer for the people in Turkey and the things they've gone through, Lord, that you'd help them, and that you'd show yourself to them. And Lord, that you would um, be there for them, um, show them what a true Christian is. May many Christians help them, Lord, at this time. And may they turn to you. And we ask that in Jesus' name. Thank you for all those that watch, Lord. And I pray that they would not just let this go in one ear and out the other, Lord, but they would take what they heard today and share it with others. Lord, I pray this video would go forth into all the world and people would see uh, that you're real and come to you for salvation. We just ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, thank you for bringing us together tonight in your word and in spirit and in truth. I pray that you will... Um, Whoever heard this, I pray that they will pray that you will just be over them and help them not to take this information with pride, but help them have a humble spirit and to seek you and to <clears throat> just believe your word as it stands. And thank you for all the blessings that you bless us with, with I mean, compared to everybody else, all the other Christians in history, we have it pretty easy. But we know we have a lot. You've given us a lot. And to whom much is given, much is required. So we pray that you will. Um, whatever your will is for us individually, I pray that you will make it manifest in our lives and that we will we will submit to your will and we will uh, we will be able to to hear when you're speaking. And I pray that you will just watch over everybody on this call and and uh, guide us to where you want us to be. And help us to be thankful and to, to bear your fruit, uh, to, to show um, good works and to show good fruit in our lives so that others can come to you. 
If there's anybody who we know that's lost, I pray that you'll put them on our hearts so we can pray for them, so you can use us to um, to witness to them or to plant a seed or whatever it is. I pray that you will just use us as vessels for your glory. And I pray that you will um, I pray that you'll bless and you'll help the rescue efforts and and with all those earthquakes and all those people who died. And I just pray that you will. Um, You'll help people get saved out of it, like like Jason said. I pray that you will, um, yeah, just just watch over everybody in this book and teach them and speak to them through it. And and thank you for being our God and being so good to us and for loving us, even though we do not deserve any of it. And may your name be glorified. And in the name of Jesus, Amen. 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 Well, thanks everyone for coming and. Brandon, Robert, I really appreciate it. And uh, God bless everyone. And if we don't see you soon, we'll see you in, in, in the air. Amen. So have a great day and great weekend. Have Brandon tell um, where they can find his book. And, yeah. Uh, well, go ahead, Brandon. Why don't you give out the your website and uh, your YouTube? And, and, and it's on Amazon, right, for $20? Yeah. If they want so, to purchase the book. Yeah. So the book, if you just go to sealedbytheking.com, it's free as a digital PDF. Or you can, there's a link there to go to Amazon for 20 bucks. And then the YouTube channel is called Truth is Christ. And um, yeah, I shouldn't be able to just find it by typing that in. Um, trying to think. Yeah, I mean, that's pretty much it. Sealedbytheking.com is the website, and Truth is Christ, the YouTube channel. Yeah, amen. Buy the book. It's worth, It's really nice to have it. Um, I bought it. It's, it's a great book. And um you know, God bless each and every one of you and uh, all, all power and glory to the Lord Jesus Christ. Thanks for coming. Have a great day. All right. Thanks for having me.